And again, you know I'm not one for the beach, but I have learned that there's a lot of people in this family who love the beach. They're there singing, dancing, in the water, out the water. Um, in fact, there are probably some of you here today and online where, you know, if you think about your dream vacation, what would it entail? It would be Oceanside, lounging on the beach, good friends, good food, living the dream. Anybody, is that their dream vacation? Anybody here? Just on the beach all day. You ever take time to think about that though? What, what would your dream life be? If I were to give you, well, maybe not me because I can't afford it. If someone was to give you a billion dollars today, okay? If someone was to give you all the money in the world, what would your dream life be? Anybody? Well, for a lot of us, it's a very deep question. I know it's a hard question to answer, but for a lot of us, what is our response more, most often? It's, I'm going to quit my job. <laughs> Goodbye job. That's the first thing to do. And, and some of the initial things we'll do is, we'll, we'll, I'm going to go to the beach all day. I'm going to take vacation and fly and do all the things and just relax. Especially in our world, in North America, where it's just so busy. There's so many things that we're doing, so many things that we have to accomplish in our life. It's so often that we're just, we want to break from it all. And our dream life would be that we would not have to work. You see, in our culture, work is often looked at as mundane task, as, a, as an obligation, as unfulfilling work that's just necessary to be done. It's just this big burden on my life. And in fact, I'm noticing that people are starting to not want to choose work. You know, lounging all day or no goals or aspirations, playing video games all day, watching TV all day, scrolling their phone, just not wanting to work. But I want to tell you, and I tell this with sensitivity, you know I love you all, but a life with no work, where we are inactive, not contributing to this world, is a life that is not biblical. It's not. Why is that? Well, it's because God has a good plan for us, and his plan for us is filled with good work. See, his design for your life is that all your days would be filled with purposeful work that fulfills you. And he empowers us. He gives us gifts and talents, creating each one of us uniquely so that we can do what he has set out for our life. So we can advance the kingdom of God and we can make a difference and impact in this world. A couple weeks ago, if you were with us, I spoke on real rest. And today, I just want to make sure that I balance us as a family. Because yes, we need real rest. We do need to be refreshed. We need to be strengthened. But we also can't stop working for the kingdom. So we can't stop doing the good works of God, especially in the summertime. You see, our devotion to the plan and will of God, it doesn't take a break in the summer. But we do the, the work of the kingdom. We continue to live out the, the purpose and plan of God for our lives through every season. See, we are made, you and I, the followers of God, we are made to do good works. And that's what I want to talk about today. The title of today's sermon is Good Works. And Apostle Paul, in the Bible, he, he, he writes a letter to the, it, 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 the letter of Ephesians. And Ephesians is a, is a fantastic letter. It talks about Jesus and the church and the relationships with God and the relationships we should have with one another. It's rich in that. And he talks about us being made for good works in the, the passage that we're going to study this morning. So if you have your Bibles, we'll turn to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, and we're going to be reading three verses, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. This is what it says. I'm reading from the NIV version. 
For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that your word is alive and active, that your word sustains and and brings us and teaches us and equips us for everything in our lives. Today, we ask you, Holy Spirit, teach us, guide us, be so specific in our hearts that we may be transformed to be more like you. I pray I decrease and you increase in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians 2. This passage might be a familiar passage for you or it might be a passage that's new to you. Either way, we can agree that this is a powerful passage. And in its entirety, this portion of scripture, it speaks to how God saved us from sin and destruction. And it also talks about how God made us with a purpose how he made us to do good in this world. You see, it's so important that we remember this, that the, the fullness of salvation for humanity are those things together, that God saved us from sin for good. You see that? God saved us from sin for good. Jesus saves us from our old life for a new life with him. And Paul, Apostle Paul, he beautifully lays it out in this portion of scripture, showing us how they go hand in hand together. You know, sometimes we read this passage and we'll read, you know, I am saved by grace through faith in Jesus, and we stop there. And that's amazing. Yes, you are saved by grace through faith. But what happens when you stop there, you miss out on the plan of God for your life, on the mission and purpose he has for you to do something in this world. On the other hand, you can start at the end. And you can focus merely on good works. And you miss out on the first part. And all of a sudden, your life and your relationship with God starts to become transactional. I'm trying to earn being saved. I'm trying to earn the love of God. But that's not the case. You see, these passages, they go hand in hand. They go together. Flowing in an order in our lives with Christ throughout the whole process. Saved by grace through faith in Christ and in Christ made new. So that we may do good in this world. Today, as we unpack God's design for good works, we'll follow the order Paul lays out in our text so that we get the fullness of God's design for our life. And Apostle Paul, the first thing he lays out in this scripture is this important truth, that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus, not by works. It says this in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Look at this. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Paul is is very direct and he tells us, your good works will not save you. Telling us that there's nothing that you and I can do to earn the forgiveness justification, and freedom of God. See, it's, it's important to not fall into the trap of thinking my, how, how many times I attend church, how many times I pray, how many times I, how much I give is what saves me. No, it's only by the work of Jesus that we are set free, that we are saved, that we have new life. If you look at our passage, we're starting at verse eight, but you read the verses before it, you see that Apostle Paul is talking to the Gentiles and he's telling them, he's opening their minds to see this, telling them there was nothing you could do in your own strength. 
There was nothing. You were powerless before, but God saved you. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, let's look at it. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the desires of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. He talks to the the Gentiles and he tells them, hey, you were dead in your sins. You were numb to the things of God, lifeless on the inside. You were following your own way doing whatever you want, following your own desires, not caring that there's a God of this universe, not caring that God had a plan for your life. He says that you were dead in your transgressions and sins, and transgressions, literally unconscious sin, continuing to slip up and sin, it literally means missing the mark of God, Not only violating the moral laws, but let me tell you, also missing the standard of goodness that he calls us to live by. You see, sometimes we look at sin, and we think sin is just all of that moral evil stuff, right? Murder, gossip, like all of those bad things. But let me tell you, sin is also not living up to the good that he's called me to be. That's also missing the mark of God. Not doing what God God has designed for me to do. He tells them, you were dead. Nothing you could do. Without Christ, we we were all destined for wrath. Let me tell you, that might be you right now. When you're living your life your own way, when you're numb to the things of God, You're following your own desires. You're following your own, you know, your own will. And you're lifeless and dead on the inside. Wrapped up in this life, feeling stuck. And deep down inside, there's this desire for love. There's this desire to be whole. There's this desire for a new life. There's this desire, somebody save me from this life. Because I want a life where I'm free. I want a life where I'm safe. I want a life where I am loved. And naturally, because we have such a strong desire, what do we do? We take it into our own hands. And we say, I'm going to make this new life. We say, hey, uh, uh, I'm going to, through my good works, I'm going to try to save myself. You see, I've done wrong, but maybe if I do more good, that will erase my wrong. You see, maybe if I live better, I'll feel better. Maybe if I, if I do more things that are good, then I'll be happy. We try to save ourselves, thinking at the end of our good works, surely there's life. Thinking at the end of our good works, surely I will earn heaven. But unfortunately, all the good work you do, it won't save you. It won't redeem you, it won't set you free, and it won't give you access to heaven. You see, it it all simply falls short. Isaiah reminds us that, that in all of our goodness, in all of our righteousness, it's filthy rags to a holy, good, and perfect God. For even, even if we put ourselves in the judge's seat, Even if we were the judges, like even if we put ourselves, how much good do we need to do to erase the wrong? How much good do we need to do to cover even the good things that we didn't do? See, how much charity work do we need to do to to cover all the impure thoughts that you have? How many days of having a clean mouth uh, uh, cover the gossip that you planted about someone else? How many days of of attending church must we have so that we can cover the pride and arrogance we have during the week? How much of it? See, how can we be worthy of heaven? What will pay the bill for our sins? Nothing. 
And that's what Paul says. And Apostle Paul, he includes himself, and this is something that I include myself too. He says that all of us were deserving of wrath. There was nothing that we could do. But then there was one who did do something. There was one who did live a blameless life. There was one who had no sin in him, who walked on this earth. There was one who said, God, I have lived a righteous life. I will take their sin. They can take my righteousness so that their lives may be pleasing before you. There was one who went to the cross and died for all of our sins, paying the bill in full, and his name is Jesus. Yeah, give him praise. There was one, and his name is is Jesus. There is nothing you and I could do. But thank God that there was something that Jesus did do. And he doesn't do it because we deserved it. He doesn't do it because we've earned it. But he does it because he loves us. Ephesians 2, 4 to 7. Look at the rest of that passage. When Paul's laying it out, he says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It's because of his love. And he spares us from punishment He is rich in mercy, but then he saves us by grace. And grace means that God gives me something I don't deserve. If you think about your life, there's a lot that God gives you that we do not deserve. It's that moment in your life, you know, sometimes people say that but God moment, you know what I'm talking about? Where it's like, I didn't do anything, but God did do something. You see, I was dead, but God made a way for me. I didn't love him, but God loved me. I was a slave, but God made me a child of God. I was poor, no money, no inheritance, but God made me a co-heir with Christ, inheritance of the king. I was lost on my own way, but God found me. There was nothing good in me, but God saved me. That is a gift. It's by grace that he has saved us. The Bible teaches us that all we need to do is to believe in him, follow him, repent from our old life, and and decide to follow him. Romans 10, 9 to 10, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it was with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. See, this is important for us to start with as we're talking about good works. Because you have to know good works don't save you. It's only the grace of God that saves you. Faith in him that will save you. See, you could be coming to church, doing all the good things, and never giving your heart to Jesus. I want to tell you, it's only your faith in him. You receiving him in your heart that will save you. We don't rely on our good works to get to heaven. We rely on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Accept him into your life. Accept him into your heart. He loves you unconditionally. But also know when you accept him into your heart, it doesn't stop there. You see, it doesn't end there. The cross isn't the end, it's the beginning. And thank God he saved us. But we can't miss what happens next. And Paul, he lays it out in our scripture and he teaches us this second thing. We are made new creations in Christ to do good works. He says that in Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, once you're saved by grace through faith, you are then created new in Christ. And if you have a Bible with you, or you're taking notes, I want you to circle that created in Christ. Meaning your old identity, your old way, your old thinking, all that was bound to sin is now dead. And now your new life 
with God has come. The Bible says in John that when we accept God in our hearts, we are literally, our spirit's born again. That we are a new creation in him with the spirit of the living God in us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. You read the rest of our chapter in Ephesians 2, Paul's telling the Gentiles, your old life, that's not you anymore. You were far from God, but because of Christ, he made you new. You see, how culture is defining you, how you define yourself with your desires, that's not you anymore. You are new in Christ. And I want to tell you, if you've accepted Christ in your life, you owe no longer what you were in the past. You're no longer defined by your desires. You're no longer the gossip, no longer the cheater, no longer the selfish, no longer the prideful, but you are a child of God made new in Christ, his son and daughter. That is who you are. Created in Christ. John 1.12 says, Yet all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See, when you're created in Christ, everything changes. And good works flow out of your life because there is good living in you. There is the spirit of Christ who is good and kind and perfect living in you. So good, flow, good works are not flowing out of obligation but they're flowing because Jesus is inside of you, changing you, transforming you through his word and his spirit as you walk with him. See, maybe before God, you didn't care much about loving God and loving others, but now created in Christ, the spirit's compelling you. I must live like him. I must do what he does. I must reflect and represent him in all that I do. Doing the same good works that Jesus models in scripture, the good work of loving others, serving others, the good work of justice, the good work of helping the poor, sharing the gospel, bringing truth, serving God, the good work of prayer and devotion. There's so many good works that Christ will lead you to and when he is in your life, when you are created in Christ and you are abiding him, let me tell you, you are compelled to live like him. And James 2 reminds us of this, that an active faith in Christ will produce good works. James 2 says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. See, if you're not doing good works, if they're not flowing out of your life, you have to ask yourself, not if I'm saved, but is my faith dead or is my faith alive? See, am I abiding in Christ? Because if Christ is in me and I in him, then I will do good. See, if, if the tree is constantly producing no fruit or bad fruit, you have to go back to the tree and say, is this tree dead or alive? See, we must all take an inventory of our lives and ask ourselves, is my faith dead or is it alive? Because an active faith where we love Jesus and follow him will always lead us to love and live like Jesus, to do the good work in this world. You know, I attended a, a meeting with the pastors in Brampton, and there was a pastor who was there, and he, he's well over his 60s, served his whole life pastoring, you know, helping the schools, doing good work. He's coming to the end, and he's not retired. He's still working. He's still doing whatever he can for the kingdom, and he's sharing to us about how he's helping his neighbor. And he's helping them get back on their feet and sharing the love of God to them. It's a beautiful story, so inspirational. But you know what really touched my heart and really, really 
you know, encouraged my spirit that when he was talking about why he was compelled to, all, to do all these things, he was choking up and he was holding back tears and he was talking about the love of God in his life. He was talking about all that Jesus has been doing in his life. You see, it wasn't a grand plan, a grand scheme, all these goals. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do all this good work. No, no, no. He simply loved Jesus. He was a son of God. He was living with him, and it compelled, it changed, it transformed him. He was living created in Christ. He was living out a life with Jesus, impacting the world through good works. See, let's do the same and live like we didn't live before. You're not, not, no longer children of darkness, let us live children of the light. Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. The fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. See, we are made, created in Christ. And I hope that's stirring up in your spirit who you are. See, you are God's handiwork, created in Christ to do good works. See, saved by grace through faith, he's created in Christ. But then there comes a moment God is leading you and he's, he's stirring in your heart. Then there comes a moment where you have to choose to do good works. See, Ephesians 2, 10, it says what? It says that created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, we have to understand that our faith will require us to do something. That, you know, there will be a time where you have to count the cost and get to work. There is a moment where we have to put our faith into practice. And Jesus, he modeled a life of doing good work. He lived purposefully and intentionally. He wasn't lazy, but he seized every opportunity to impact the world. You remember that, 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 that there's a story in scripture where the disciples are going to Jesus and they're saying, hey, you need food, you need to rest. And you know what he tells them in, in John 4? He says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. See, we all need to be reminded that the spirit that is living in us is not a lazy spirit. It's not a spirit that says, ah, you know, somebody else will do it, somebody else will do the good work, but it's a spirit that says, I will go. I will do good. I will serve. That's the spirit of Christ. You see, we're not to receive our freedom and salvation and look to the clouds and just wait for Jesus' return. So I wonder when Jesus is coming back. No. We're to work. Do the good work of the kingdom. Work now. Galatians 5.13, for you, my brothers and sisters, we're called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. See, as citizens of the kingdom who understand that time in this world is short, we should work with intention. We should work diligently. You know that slogan in life? Life is too short. Take it easy. Relax. Enjoy your life. Those are for people who have no view of eternity. Life is short, but eternity is long. So we have to do whatever we can to impact eternity today. See, that's the view we should have. 1 Peter 4, 7 to 10, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. Be very careful then. 
how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Choose to do good work. And know when you choose it, God will empower you. God is in you. God is the one who prepares it in advance for you to do. That's what the scripture tells us. That the good works he's made for us are prepared in advance for us to do. And oftentimes in, in work that's especially hard or uncomfortable. Leading a life group, uh, serving in the church, giving to the poor, volunteering somewhere, sharing about God in your workplace. Oftentimes the hard work, it's difficult for us to choose because we feel like we won't be equipped. But you have to remember that every good work that God laid out in your life is prepared for you, prepared in advance, meaning that God will equip you. God will help you. See, we need to look at it like that and remember that all that's required for us is to have faith and obey. Other translations of our scripture, it says that good works are prepared in advance and it uses these words, for us to walk in. And I'm praying that we would change our perspective in our life, knowing that everywhere around me, there is good work for me to walk in. Everywhere I go, there is a good work that God has prepared. And all it requires of me is to walk right through it. So as you're getting ready for work in the morning, and maybe you have a job that you don't love as much, pray to God. Thank him. And say, God, what good work have you prepared in advance for me to do today? What good work have you prepared for me in advance today for my family, for my household? For my church, what good work, God, have you prepared for me? Ask of God, and he will lead you and empower you. But it all starts from a willingness to do. And it will require our prayers to change with the Lord. Not only asking of God, what can you do for me? But also asking God, what have you prepared for me to do? See, that's how we need to change our perspective. And as he leads, have the courage to obey. It's not gonna be easy. It's called good work, why? Because it's work. Remember, Jesus never promised us an easy life, but he promised us a fulfilling one. Matthew 16 says, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. We have this saying in lead school that, that we're challenging them to change their mindset. And I want to challenge you too. May this be your prayer as well. We're going to put it up. That our heart should be this. I don't want an easy life. I want a fulfilled one. One filled with the vision of God to do his will and the willingness to give our lives for his work. See, embrace the hard work of the kingdom. It will fulfill you. It will give you purpose. And remember, that work is good. It's good. In fact, at the beginning of time, in the book of Genesis, the very good plan of God was us in perfect relationship with him and us also working with him. You know, stewards of this earth, looking over all the things of the earth. You see, work came before the fall of man. It was in the good design of God. It's good. On the other hand, an easy, idle, lazy life will result in an unfulfilled life. No impact. Wasted time. You know, in fact, it's, it's mostly in our idleness that the devil traps us. It's mostly in our idleness that the devil starts to create these destructive habits in our life. It, when you're scrolling Instagram for so long that you fall into these fake truths 
that start to govern your lives, when you're binge watching TV so long, not knowing all these ungodly lifestyles are influencing your life. When you're gossiping at others, about others, why? Just because you have the time to do it. You see, an idle life is never good. It often leads to destruction. And I'm not saying we don't rest. I love to rest. For sure we rest, but we rest to work, not work to rest. We recharge to accomplish our purpose. You see, the work of God will always result in a fulfilled life, so work at it with all your heart, all your mind. Work at it with diligence, with full intention. Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And I understand, for some of us here, you might say, well, pastor, I'm just so busy. And it's true, you are busy. We're one of the most busy people in the world. Everyone is busy. But the question, and I want to sensitively ask you this, is are you busy with the right things? See, is what you're busy with the things that God prepared in advance for you to do? Is what you're busy with the things that will have an eternal impact on your soul and on the lives of others, or are they just distractions? You see, if we have no time to love our neighbors, if we have no time to love God, if we have no time to come to church to pray, if we have no time to serve others, then we are busy with the wrong things. And it's time to reprioritize our life. And we all have the same hours in our day. The difference we make in eternity will be determined by how we use those hours. Let us store up treasures in heaven, not in this world, doing the work of God. You know, I want to encourage you, there's a mission trip coming up. And if you in your heart, it's stirring in your heart, prayerfully really consider obeying God and going on mission. Choose to do the good work of God. Reprioritize your life. Follow him in all the things he's leading you in. And you will know this last thing that I want to encourage you in is that doing good work is never in vain. See, when you sacrifice and do the good works of God, you have to know that it's never a waste. It's never a waste to serve God and work with him. For some of us, I know that you have been working really hard for the Lord. And I want to encourage you. God is pleased with you. Continue to work for God. Continue to follow him. Continue to do it. Find rest in him and don't give up. Galatians 6 says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know, I want you to hear this, that your labor in the Lord is, is not in vain. I grew up serving in the church. I grew up being that weird kid who didn't go to some things because I was in the house of God or helping others. And you know, I've come to this moment in my life, I look back and none of it was a waste. There are sacrifices, yes, but I would choose those sacrifices all over again. Because doing the work of God, is a, there's nothing like it. And yes, we will store up treasures in heaven. Yes, there will be a time when we stand before the judge and he will give out rewards. But also in this life, I look back at all the life change I've been a part of. 
I look back at all the moments with God that has marked my life, changed my heart and my soul. Being a witness to the hand of God, I will tell you, working with the Lord is a fulfilling life. And there is nothing like it. And I encourage you today, pause and remember the joy of serving the Lord. There is a joy like no other when you serve the Lord. Remember how fulfilling it is to follow Jesus. Remember that, that, that in relationship with him, working with him, that is the good life. That is the best life. Continue to do good. Continue to serve. It is never in vain. You know, as we wrap up and we're going to be closing out and I want to pray for us, but you know what's so interesting about our key texts? You know, we're reading about these scriptures, right? Paul, he's writing it to us from prison. A prisoner of the gospel, bound because of good work. He's in chains because he's doing the good work of God. And yet he still encourages the church, love, serve God. You would think in his teachings we would see, this life is too hard. Turn back. It's not worth it. I'm in chains. Don't do it. But we don't see that. Why? Because following God is not easy, but it is fulfilling. Today, remember how good God has been to you. Remember his saving grace on your life. Remember there's nothing you could do but God did something for you. Remember that he saved you. Remember who you are. You're made new, created in Christ. Remember he has a purpose for you. And he has good work laid out all around you, prepared in advance for you to walk through. Choose to do the good work. And I'm praying that your hearts, your spirit are stirred again to be the ones who will say, yes, God, I will go. To say, yes, God, I will serve. To say, yes, God, yes, I know the harvest is plenty, the workers are few, but I, Lord, am choosing to be one of those workers. You see, you are made to do good works.